Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. In 2002, the Boston Globe exposed sexual abuse scandals in Catholic churches in their city and managed to pierce a long-held shameful secret because it wasn't just Boston. It was everywhere. They opened a floodgate of survivors around the world, and people who had been scared to speak up finally found the courage. In McAllen, Texas, a former beauty queen and Hispanic teacher was raped and murdered in 1960, and the case was never solved, until someone, over 40 years later, finally came forward in 2002. 25-year-old Irene Garza was an extremely devout Catholic who gave confession every Saturday without fail. She was a school teacher for underprivileged children. Irene was idolized not only for her beauty, but for her kindness and generosity. The investigation into her murder was one of the largest and most publicized in the Rio Grande Valley's history. Locals believed that Irene's killer would swiftly be found and brought to justice. But quickly and quietly, the investigation pretty much shut down. Rumor had it, a priest had murdered Irene. And a Catholic sheriff, working with the church, decided to bury the truth. Welcome to episode 125, Final Confession, The Murder of Irene Garza. The Catholic Church has been present in the Rio Grande Valley since the Spanish colonization of the region. Today's case takes us to the city of McAllen, Texas, now one of the most populous cities in the area. It's located at the southern tip of the Rio Grande Valley. It was a small town with less than 10,000 residents when Irene Garza was born and had grown to be a small city of about 33,000 when she was murdered. The McAllen city limits extend to the southwest as far as the Rio Grande, directly north of Reynosa, Tamaulipas in Mexico. A toll bridge was purchased by McAllen in 1940 and renamed the McAllen Hidalgo Reynosa International Bridge making McAllen a winter resort and port of entry to Mexico. The bridge greatly increased tourist trade, and McAllen and Reynosa became sister cities. In the 1930s, most parts of McAllen were heavily segregated. The neighborhoods, the schools, and even the hospital in town, where, as CNN put it, Mexican-Americans and Anglos were treated in separate wards. Mexican-Americans faced discrimination in McAllen, although a great deal of the city's residents were of Mexican descent. But as the city grew, the dividing lines disappeared as white citizens became the minority. Today, almost 85% of residents of McAllen identify as Hispanic or Latino. But in 1960, before the end of segregation, light-skinned beauty Irene Garza transcended most discrimination. On Saturday, April 16, 1960, most McAllen residents were preparing for Easter the next day. Easter eggs and baskets and chocolate bunnies filled the windows of the storefronts. It was Holy Saturday, and the priests were preparing for the large Mass the next day on Easter Sunday. 25-year-old Irene was happily making Easter baskets for her younger cousins earlier that day. She called the kids and excitedly told them about their baskets for their annual family Easter egg hunt the next day. The children and her family adored and counted on Irene. She never let them down. Later on that Saturday, Irene called her friend Sylvia to see if she wanted to attend confession with her, but Sylvia wasn't home. So Irene went alone, arriving at the Sacred Heart Church at around 7 p.m. Though several people saw the striking young woman at church that night, putting a white lace veil over her head and kneeling to pray, no one ever saw her leave the church. Irene still lived at home with her parents, and when she wasn't home by midnight, they were worried and went looking for her. They found her car at 2.30 a.m., parked outside the Sacred Heart Church, but there was no sign of Irene. Friends, families, and neighbors formed search parties that fateful Easter Sunday to look for Irene, and they soon called in the police. City, state, and county police joined the search, including 70 members of the Hidalgo Sheriff's Office, many of which were on horses, and 65 members of the National Guard. An airplane was used to search the land below the sky, Divers searched irrigation canals, and the community of McAllen banded together to find Irene. Early in the investigation of Irene's disappearance, 
Police focused on where Irene had last been seen and where her car remained parked, the Sacred Heart Church. Witnesses had seen Irene arrive around 7 p.m., kneeling and praying, and getting in line for confession. She was also seen entering the rectory. The last time anyone remembered seeing her was 8.15, and no one saw her leave the church. Multiple priests said they were inside the rectory before, during, and after Irene arrived, but none of them reported anything suspicious to the authorities. The following day, April 18th, the search continued. Neighbors and other concerned members of the community decided to drive some of the back roads of McAllen, searching for any sign of the missing young woman. They soon spotted a dark brown purse off the side of the road covered in mud. Irene's identification was inside. One of her high heels and her white lace veil were also found along the roadsides. Police theorized the purse, shoe, and veil were thrown out of a car window as someone drove the back roads. In the first few days following Irene's disappearance, police received hundreds of leads. One was a tourist who joked to a waitress that he killed Irene and said the waitress was next. She didn't think it was funny and reported him. He apologized to police, explaining he had been drinking and meant no harm. Another hoax was called in by a woman, claiming to be Irene, saying she was being held in a motel room in Hidalgo. Police raced to the motel, their time wasted again. Though the volume of leads was promising, it was also frustrating. On April 21st, 1960, five days after Irene vanished from the church, her body was found floating in the 2nd Street Irrigation Canal in McAllen, face down. The canal was around three miles from the Sacred Heart Church, where Irene was last seen, waiting to give her confession. Her body was still partially dressed, but her blouse was unbuttoned, and her underwear and shoes were missing. At autopsy, Irene's cause of death was determined as trauma to the right side of head, hemorrhage of the brain, and suffocation. The autopsy report also noted she had been raped, but specified that it was while she was in a coma. There is no explanation on how the coroner came to that conclusion, and I can't speculate. After the first couple of days, when Irene's belongings were found scattered on the road, her family had lost hope of finding her alive. At least now, they could lay their beloved daughter to rest. Irene Garza was born in McAllen on November 15, 1934, to parents Nicholas and Josephine. Irene, her younger sister Josie, and their parents were an extremely close and loving family. The Garzas wanted the absolute best for their daughters and hoped they would not experience the discrimination that they had faced growing up in McAllen. When Josephine and Nicholas were young, Hispanics and Mexican-Americans were only allowed to go to school until the fifth grade. But when Irene Garza was born in 1934, her parents were determined that she and Josie could rise above any discrimination together. They said to their children, when you go to college, instead of if, and cultivated a love for learning in both girls. At the time of Irene's death, the acceptance of the Hispanic and Latino community in McAllen remained tense. The town divided by a railroad, and the white community definitely lived on the right side. But as I said, Irene was able to transcend much of the discrimination others faced. And it wasn't just because of her beauty, her fair skin tone, or her gentle personality. She didn't live in Southtown, or the proverbial other side of the tracks, with most of the Hispanic community. Her parents ran a very successful dry cleaning shop. The Garzas lived in a nice neighborhood. Irene and Josie attended Catholic school until high school when they enrolled in McAllen High. The Garza sisters were the first Mexican-American twirlers at McAllen High. And eventually, Irene would go on to become McAllen High's first Mexican-American drum majorette. After high school, Irene attended Pan American College in Edinburgh, Texas, to become an elementary school teacher. She was the first in her family to go to college, and she was loved by her new peers, crowned prom and homecoming queen. Following graduation, Irene took a job teaching second grade at Thigpen Elementary, back home in McAllen. Soon, Josie followed in her big sister's footsteps, becoming a schoolteacher as well. Irene was described as having a way with children, and she chose to work in a low-income school, often spending her own paycheck to buy school supplies and things the children needed. Many of the children didn't even own shoes. 
She also spent time working in her community, including every Saturday when she visited the nursing home and did residents' hair, nails, and other tasks that they wanted so they could look and feel their best when their families came to visit on Sundays. Beyond her passion for helping others, those close to Irene also spoke of her exceptional beauty. Irene is described as having a natural effervescence, but her family and friends said her beauty never went to her head because her heart was so big. In 1958, Irene was crowned Miss South Texas. Irene's cousin Linda said Irene was, quote, really a role model, and to see how she had gone through college, was a teacher, was a beauty queen, and yet was just a very sweet and simple person. Others described her as an inspiration to little girls. She was so poised and elegant, they remembered. Irene was very religious. Her faith and commitment to God was very important to her. She never skipped confession, visiting the Sacred Heart Church every Saturday, whether she needed to or not, her family joked. And then she attended church every Sunday. The church, which her family had attended for many years, was only a five-minute drive from their home, and Irene and her family felt like Sacred Heart was a second home, a place where they felt loved and safe. Irene was also active in the Legion of Mary, a Catholic association that serves the church on a voluntary basis. At the time of her death, Irene lived near downtown McAllen with her sister and parents in a nice neighborhood. Though she was social, at 25 she had yet to marry and start a family, milestones she wistfully thought of often. In the week before her murder, on April 9, 1960, Irene wrote a letter to one of her friends. This letter showed a side of the beauty queen people might not have known. Despite her striking looks and accomplishments, Irene was very shy. She was thrilled to have been elected PTA secretary because, quote, it means I'm overcoming my terrible shyness and becoming surer of myself. I've made quite a few friends this year and am much happier than I have ever been. And it seemed that Irene was nursing a bit of a broken heart. She revealed in the letter that her ex-boyfriend sent her several cards and a box of candy on Valentine's Day. She wrote that she thought of him often and wondered if she'd ever get over him, quote, I pray constantly that if it be God's will, I will get over him eventually. But Irene also shared with her friend that she'd been dating two men. She was coy with their names, but said the second man was, quote, an Anglo boy, not real handsome, but cute and religious, which is important. Though her romantic life was occupying some of her time, Irene remained committed to her relationships with work and God. She wrote, These children I am teaching have been such a joy to me. And beautifully, but in retrospect, also chillingly, Irene also wrote, Remember the last time we talked? I told you I was afraid of death? Well, I think I'm cured. You see, I've been going to communion and mass daily, and you can't imagine the courage and faith and happiness it has given me. Just 12 days after writing those words, investigators discovered Irene's body in the canal and her missing persons case became a homicide investigation. Hidalgo County Sheriff E.E. E. Vickers assured the public that his detectives would leave no stone unturned, and the mayor announced a blank check to the police department to solve the crime. Local businesses donated reward money totaling $10,000. Around four blocks south of where Irene's body surfaced, police found a muddy shoe print with a strand of thick, dark-colored hair stuck inside of it, a hair believed to belong to Irene Garza. There were also tire tracks and the faint imprint of Irene's petticoat found in the mud. Police theorized that the killer had unloaded Irene's body from a car and dumped her into the water. The city of McAllen was shocked at the discovery of Irene's body and were sickened at the thought of such a well-respected young woman being victimized in their town. After Irene's body was found, The Valley Morning Star reported that, quote, the city had been in a state of near hysteria as rumors flew thick and fast. The report said, rumors as to the identity of the murderer went beyond the ridiculous, and it appeared that everyone was prepared to believe anything. Police interviewed more than 500 people in the weeks after Irene's body was found. They took statements from Irene's family and friends, as well as co-workers and ex-boyfriends, including men who just took her on one date. They were most desperate to find someone who had seen her that night. More than 60 people were given polygraphs. Sex offenders all over the region were questioned and alibied. 
Despite the scope of the investigation, police were focused on Irene's last known whereabouts, the Sacred Heart Church. Anyone who was in the church on April 16th was interviewed. During that evening, three priests and one visiting priest were present to hear confessions throughout the early afternoon and again during the evening. Investigators even mapped out the evening's confession lines. They reconstructed where each parishioner was standing and charted the different locations of each person. They learned that one of Irene's second-grade students and his mother were in the church that night. While they did not see Irene, they did see a purse that was left behind on a pew inside the church. After praying, and when no one had yet collected the purse, the student and his mother took it to the rectory and gave it to one of the priests, Father John Fight. The police also learned that on the evening Irene disappeared, she was seen going into the church's rectory alone. A rectory, for those unfamiliar with the Catholic Church, is the residence of a church's priests or clergymen, which is usually attached to the church itself and typically off-limits to non-clergy members. Prior to Irene's entrance to the rectory, witnesses had seen three priests, not including Father John Fight, return to the church from the rectory. None of the witnesses recalled seeing Irene return from the residential space. Police continued to encounter one name throughout their investigation, Father John Fight. As far as they knew, Father John had been the last person to see Irene alive, because they were told he had heard Irene's confession that night. They began looking into his background. Two weeks later, police drained the canal where the shoe print had been found and where they believed Irene's body was dumped. As the water was removed from the area, investigators unearthed a light green photo slide viewer. Police put a picture of the slide viewer in the local newspapers and asked for the public's help in identifying the viewer's owner. A few days later, a familiar name once again came across investigators' desks. 27-year-old Father John Fight had written a note to the police saying he was the owner of the photo slide viewer, but he didn't explain why the viewer was in the canal. A candelabra from Sacred Heart was also found in the canal, but for some unknown reason, police didn't try to match it to the wounds on Irene's body, even though it had likely been used in the murder. Decades later, when an investigator was asked why Father John would write to the police and identify himself, the detective said he believed the priest was taunting the police. Father Bernard Fight was born on November 24, 1932, in Illinois. He was a native of Chicago, and his uncle was a priest in Detroit. When Fight was 13, his parents sent him to a seminary in San Antonio, Texas. He studied for the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate and was ordained at the age of 25 in 1958. In 1960, Fight was attending a year of pastoral training at the missionary oblates in San Juan, Texas. He was also helping out at Sacred Heart Church in Edinburgh, Texas, which is around 11 miles from San Juan. Though he had already been ordained at a relatively young age, when people would ask Fight why he became a priest, he would say offhandedly, I just wanted to give it a try. Fight was known as a bright and well-mannered man, but also someone who was aloof and kind of a loner. Multiple witnesses told police they saw Father John in and around the church campus throughout the evening of April 16th. But when police finally spoke to him, he claimed he never saw Irene for confession on April 16th. Despite this, later on in their investigation, Father John admitted that he had heard Irene's confession sometime around 7 p.m., and then he left the rectory with her at 7.30 p.m. But no other witnesses could corroborate his story. Police did learn that following the Easter vigil, Father John and other priests were drinking coffee together when he told them about an encounter with Irene the night of her disappearance. He said she wanted to go to confession in the rectory, but he told her to confess in the church. Police doubted his story. They had spoken with Irene's friend, Anna Marie Hollingsworth, who told police that during Holy Week that year, Irene had mentioned a young visiting priest who she thought was handsome. Irene told Anna Marie that the new priest, Father John, told her she was too good to confess in the confessional. Instead, he would take Irene to the rectory to hear her confession. Anna Marie said Irene was confused by Father John's insistence, but followed his lead regardless. 
That might sound suspicious to us in the year 2021, but back then, the extremely devout Irene would have completely trusted a priest. While investigating Father Fight, police learned about an attack on another young woman, Maria America Guerra, that had taken place at the Sacred Heart Church in nearby Edinburgh, Texas, just 12 miles away. On March 23, 1960, 20-year-old America Guerra returned from Pan American College to her home in Edinburgh, located across the street from the Sacred Heart Church. As Guerra cleaned herself up in the outside bathroom of her home, she noticed a man watching her. He had black hair and horn-rimmed glasses and was sitting in a blue and white 1956 or 57 car parked outside the church. She decided to ignore him. After dinner, she crossed the street to go pray at the Sacred Heart Church and noticed the car was still parked there, but the man was gone. When America walked in the church, she saw the man who had been watching her seated in a back pew, but she kept walking to the front of the church to the altar to pray. As she knelt down, she was attacked from behind. The man shoved a piece of cloth into her mouth as she screamed and kicked. She bit his finger hard enough to taste blood. The man then threw her to the ground and ran out of the church. A witness, a woman named Maria Cristina Tijarina, heard Guerra's screams and saw the man fleeing from the church. When she saw America Guerra run out, she asked her if she was okay, but America ran home. Later that night, she did report the attack to the police. Church officials suspected that Father John was responsible for the attack. But instead of turning him in or notifying law enforcement, the church's solution was to send Father John 12 miles away to the Sacred Heart Church in McAllen. There, they could keep an eye on the young father fight. In early May of 1960, police asked America Guerra and Maria Tijarina to view a lineup in an attempt to identify the man in horn-rimmed glasses who had attacked Guerra. Both of the women identified the man as Father John Fight. Father Fight admitted to police that he was at Sacred Heart in Edinburgh on March 23rd, the day of the attack, but he said he was there praying until 5.15 p.m. when he left to talk to another church member. He said he was back in San Juan by 5.30 to ring the church bell. During this conversation, police noticed John's finger had what looked to be a bite mark. He said he'd heard it on the mimeograph machine on March 22nd. America Guerra was a young, attractive Hispanic woman, similar in looks to Irene Garza. Based on their physical similarities and that both women had possibly been attacked by the same priest, investigators decided to give Father John a polygraph test. During two days of polygraph examinations, John was evasive about Irene's murder and the attack on America. He was asked about what Irene confessed to on April 16th. He was also asked to explain scratches on his hands. Fight said the confession from Irene had upset him so much that night that he was sweating profusely and needed to drive around to cool down. Since he sweated so much, he drove to the San Juan Parsonage to change. He said it was locked, so he climbed up a tree to get into a second-story window, which he claimed resulted in the scratches on his hands. Father John failed all polygraphs. According to the police report, in their opinion, He was responding in a manner that would indicate beyond doubt that he was concealing facts and he had guilty knowledge. Sacred Heart's assistant pastor, Father Joseph O'Brien, told police that Father John had some injuries the night Irene disappeared. There were scratches that ran vertically down his hands and on the tops of his arms. Father O'Brien said he was suspicious of Father John for several reasons. He had used the parish car many times that day, which struck him as odd not just because of Irene's disappearance, but it was also Easter Sunday, an extremely busy day for the church. Father O'Brien said he even tried to follow Father John on Easter night, but lost him in traffic. Worried about Irene Garza and suspicious of the young priest, Father O'Brien said he searched the basement and attic of the rectory, but didn't find anything. The next time the police spoke with Father John Fight, he changed his story. This time, he said that on April 16th at 7 p.m., he and Father O'Brien were leaving the rectory when Irene called. She asked to speak to a Father Junius, but he was hearing confession in the church, so Fight said he could talk to her if she could come over immediately. According to this version of events, Irene showed up and they discussed a personal problem in the rectory so Irene wouldn't be overheard. 
Then, Veidt said he told her to go to the church confessional. He said he left with her and then went to the confessional where the line of parishioners were waiting to confess. Presumably, Irene joined this line. Later, around 8 p.m., Veidt said he got the rectory keys from Father O'Brien and went for a break. He claimed he returned to the church by 8.15. By 9 p.m., he said he was getting hoarse, so he returned to the rectory for a cigarette and a drink. Then he went back to the church to hear confessions. However, the people who were waiting in Father John's line for confession told police the line stopped moving around 8 p.m. and that there was no sign that there was anyone in the confessional. At around 9.50 p.m., Father John claimed he noticed a screw had fallen out of his glasses. He told another senior priest that he needed to go to San Juan, about five miles away from McAllen, to get his other pair of glasses. But when he got to San Juan, he realized the door was locked. He placed a wooden barricade against a wall and climbed in through a second-story window. Now, Fight insisted that this was how he scraped his hands. Then he went back to McAllen and said the midnight Easter vigil mass with the other priests. Fight's story continued to Easter Day, in which he said he offered two morning masses, a late afternoon mass, and performed baptisms in the afternoon. That evening, he said he went back to Sacred Heart to pick up his suit coat and Roman collar, which he had left behind. There, he saw a priest in the rectory who asked him if he would speak to Irene's parents. The Garzas had heard that Irene had confessed to Father John before she went missing, and they wanted to know if he had said anything that might have upset their daughter. Fight simply said no and walked away. According to his statement to the police, talking to the Garzas disturbed him, so instead of driving back to San Juan, he drove around aimlessly for a while to calm himself. Even with these messy, inconsistent stories, investigators didn't think they had enough to charge Fight. Instead, they decided to go after him for the attack on America Guerra. They had two eyewitnesses in that case. On August 5, 1960, Father John was charged with a felony count of assault with intent to rape in the case of Maria America Guerra. But when police went to arrest him, he was nowhere to be seen around McAllen or San Juan. A week later, he surrendered himself, saying, I am innocent of the charge for which I have been indicted. I am not a fugitive, nor have I been a fugitive. I am hiding from nobody because I have nothing to hide. When asked to explain his whereabouts in the last week, since his arrest warrant was issued, Fight said he checked into an out-of-state hospital because, quote, his nervous system was affected by the stress of his legal issues and speculation of his involvement in Guerra's attack. He said, quote, I wanted to try and get some rest and peace of mind. I felt I could not take it anymore. Records from the Catholic Church proved that John Fight had spent around two weeks in a church-run medical center in St. Louis called the Alexian Brothers Hospital and Dispensary. But Father John would not have gone to this church care facility for anxiety. The Alexian Brothers Hospital specialized in the treatment of priests who had been sexually abusive. According to Thomas Doyle, a Catholic priest and expert in clergy abuse cases, quote, in that era, from the 60s and even before that, on into the 70s and 80s, when bishops had bad actors among the priests, including sexual abuse, they would send priests to specialized health care facilities. In this case, Alexian brothers, they took in priests and promised anonymity. After fight made bail, he returned to the Alexian brothers' hospital. Rumors of Father John's involvement in Irene's murder had escalated in the press when he was charged for the attack on America Guerra. There was so much press about Father John that his trial for the attack on Guerra was transferred from Hidalgo County to Travis County. This only made the rumors and speculation worse. In September of 1961, John Fight's trial for the attack on America Guerra ended in a hung jury. The jury had been 9-3 to three in favor of convicting Fight. A retrial was scheduled for spring of the following year. Five months later, in February of 1962, Fight was sent to the new Melloray Abbey in Dubuque, Iowa, a monastery for Trappist monks, which are an offshoot of monks from the Roman Catholic tradition. Expert Thomas Doyle said it was a perfect place to hide. He said, quote, he would be there, have no access to the outside world. They're like maximum security monasteries, and it was not uncommon if a priest was going to be punished, they'd send them there. It was unlikely that anyone at the monastery would know about John's past. 
Oftentimes, records concerning troubled priests were not kept. In March of 1962, before his second trial, Father John Fight took a plea deal. He pled no contest to a misdemeanor count of aggravated assault and agreed to a $500 fine and court costs. In exchange, Hidalgo County District Attorney Robert Lattimore and John Fight reached an unofficial plea bargain that would greatly benefit the priest and, more importantly, protect the reputation of the church. Even though the deal wasn't in writing, the judge who sentenced Father John for the no-contest plea said he agreed to the plea bargain. In a trade for his plea of no contest, the police and DA's office would stop investigating John Fight and would not prosecute him for the murder of Irene Garza. Because a plea deal is not unenforceable simply because it wasn't put in writing, the judge's decision to uphold the deal was technically allowed. The Catholic Church obviously supported the deal, saying it was best for the community to relocate Father John out of the area, placing him in a monastery. Fight returned to the monastery in Dubuque, Iowa. Around the same time, Irene's parents got a visit from Father Joseph O'Brien from Sacred Heart. He told the family that even if Irene's killer was Father John, the church would take care of him. They would find justice within the church. This obviously was not enough for the Garza family, who were now completely disillusioned with the system. The family rightly believed that the church was conspiring with police, but they didn't have proof. Throughout this time of church-imposed punishment, fight was overseen by Reverend Joseph O'Brien. O'Brien was dubbed a special investigator by the city manager of McAllen, essentially serving as Fight's religious probation officer. It's unclear how long Fight stayed in Iowa, but according to CBS, he wrote a letter on New Mallory letterhead on June 19, 1962. The letter said, quote, The time has come to make some definite decisions, enabling me to begin a regular and ordered life with definite goals and with a definite aim in life. And just like that, he picked up and moved on with his life, still a free man. In early 1963, Fight was again relocated, this time to the Lady of Assumption Abbey near Ava, Missouri, another Trappist monastery. John was counseled and guided by Dale Tashney, a priest and monk at the Abbey. Tashney was in charge of determining whether John was called for the monastic life. After six months, Tashney and his superior determined it was safe for Father Fight to go back out into the world. This time, John Fight moved to Loyola College, which was a Jesuit school in John's hometown of Chicago. Former priest Patrick Wall told CBS that this move was pretty common. You can't put him back in a parish, so they stuck him in a school. John attended Loyola for a semester, but the transition was short-lived. On November 22, 1963, JFK was assassinated, and the famously Catholic president's death supposedly greatly upset John Fight. He left Loyola shortly after and never finished his degree. By the end of 1964, he moved to the Servants of the Paraclete, a facility run by a Roman Catholic religious order in Jemez Springs, New Mexico. This monastery was a last resort for the church's most troubled priests. Other priests described the monastery as supermax, because the priests do not have other options of places to go if they wish to stay in the church. Fight would stay there for seven years, and eventually joined the Servants of the Paraclete. Within four years, in 1968, Fight was transitioned into the role of a superior. In this role, he actually supervised priests who had been sexually abusive, and determined when these men were eligible to return back to parishes and work with children again. During his time, he supervised more than 80 priests. One of the most prolific was James Porter. He arrived in 1967 following multiple complaints of abuse of children in Massachusetts. Mike Reck, an attorney representing more than a dozen of Porter's victims, said Porter was one of the most dangerous and depraved sexually offensive priests ever. Fight worked with Porter for over a year and a half. He sometimes released Porter on temporary assignments to churches in need of staffing, allowing the child molester to visit at least four locations around New Mexico, as well as Texas, while under his supervision. Each time Porter was released to work at a church, he abused young boys, usually Hispanic boys ranging from age 7 to 10 years old. Despite this, and his knowledge of the continued abuse, 
Veit read a letter to Porter's home diocese during this time that read, There has been no occurrence of the problem that plagued Father Porter in the past. During these assignments, and after he was released, Porter continued his abuse for more than 20 years. He later pled guilty to molesting 28 children, but he told a reporter he abused upwards of 100. If you've ever seen the movie Spotlight, the Porter case may ring a bell for you. It's one of the early cases that helped the newspaper go after the church when the attorney for the victims gave up the names of several priests he settled claims on after the publicity of the Porter case. It is an incredible movie and relatable to Irene's case as the reporters discovered a history of sexually abusive priests being moved to different parishes and supposed treatment centers, just like John Fate was. If you want to learn more about the Globe's investigation that broke open the global scandal for the church, read Betrayal, The Crisis in the Catholic Church. It is written by the Spotlight team of reporters and editors. Throughout these years of relocation and movement of fight, there was no progress and no further investigation into Irene Garza's murder. The deal struck between law enforcement and the church had kept fight from prosecution, and the church's reputation remained intact, all while the Garza family prayed for some answers to what happened to their daughter. By 1971, Fight had determined that he was done with a life of priesthood. Unlike being in prison, he couldn't be forced to stay in the church. Fight requested dispensation from his obligations as a priest and a member of the Servants of the Paraclete. After his request was granted and Fight had left the priesthood, Father Joseph O'Brien notified the McAllen police through a letter to their chief stating, I have just received notice that John Fight left Denham Springs, New Mexico, and is now living in the Chicago area. He is seeking employment as a layman and will no longer function as a priest. This was his own decision and was not due to a problem. If any further information is needed, please feel free to call upon me. Once he was free of the church, John Fight seemingly went on to live a normal life. He married a Hispanic woman he met in New Mexico and had three children. Fight worked multiple jobs, including selling insurance, and he moved around a bit before settling in Phoenix in 1979 where his older brother was living and working as a priest. He also worked for decades at a Catholic food bank in Scottsdale. With John Fight out of the picture, the investigation into Irene's murder faded away. The media continued to suspect Fight's involvement, and Irene's family continued investigating the case on their own, as well as applying pressure to law enforcement. Despite their efforts, by the early 2000s, the city of McAllen and the Garza family felt that Irene's killer would never be brought to justice. In April of 2002, former monk Dale Tashney wrote to retired San Antonio cold case investigator George Sadler. Tashney told the investigator the following. He met Fight at a monastery in Ava, Missouri in 1963, and he was in charge of determining Fight's fitness for the monastic life. This was four months after the Boston Globe's investigation threw the Catholic Church into a global scandal. Thousands of priests in America and all over the world were being outed and charged. It was front-page news, a constant reminder of the dirty secret Dale Tashney had held for John Fight in the church. He could no longer stand the guilt he felt. Damningly, Tashney had been told by a superior that he needed to counsel John Fight because he had killed a woman and they needed to know if Fight could fit in and become a monk. Over the course of many months, Fight admitted to killing a woman in her 20s. Tashney asked Fight how he was in the monastery and not prison, and Father John told him, the church protected me. Fight told Tashney that he heard the woman's confession, took her blouse off, and fondled her breasts. Then he forced her into the rectory's basement. Tashney assumed that Fight had bound and gagged the woman in order to get her into the basement. Later that evening, Fight said he took the woman to the pastoral house where he lived. Before leaving for Mass the next day, which was Easter Sunday, Fight said he put the woman in the bathtub. As he left her there, Fight said he heard the woman say, I can't breathe. Tashney speculated that Fight had put a cellophane bag or some other suffocating material over her head. Fight told Tashney when he later returned that the woman was dead, so he dumped her body on the side of the road close to a canal. He told Tashney that on his way to dump the woman's body, he patted her breasts, even though he knew she was dead, saying, Irene, everything will be okay. Everything will be okay, Irene. 
In his letter, Tashney said John never gave the entire name of the victim or the location of the murder, but he thought the murder happened between 1961 and 1963 in San Antonio and that the cause of death was suffocation. Dale Tashney's story was off. He thought the murder happened in San Antonio because that's where Fight went to school, and he thought the murder happened in 1963 because that's when Fight arrived at the monastery. In the letter, Tashney also wrote that Fight admitted to him that the sound of a woman's high heels clicking on the ground would trigger him to attack the woman from behind. According to Tashney, Fight said he had a sexual compulsion to attack women from behind, especially when he knelt behind them in church. In an attempt at reverting these behaviors and to ensure that Fight was safe to leave the monastery, Tashney had Fight kneel behind women in church to see if he had any urges. When Fight claimed that he didn't, he was cleared. Dale Tashney said he never told anyone about what Fight said because he felt like his job was only to counsel the man within the parameters of the church's orders. He finally came forward years later because of the guilt that he felt, probably triggered by the explosive and continuing headlines about sexual abuse within the church. He said he wanted the victim's family to know what happened and wanted to clear his conscience. San Antonio police didn't know anything about Irene's death, but the Texas Rangers did. Irene's case had actually been reopened that year, and Ranger Rudy Jaramillo had been working the investigation, frustrated as he went through the decades-old evidence. The McAllen police chief asked the newly formed cold case unit of the Texas Rangers to help. Ranger Jaramillo led the investigation. In November 2002, Del Tashney met with Ranger Jaramillo. After hearing all the details John Fight had told Del Tashney, Ranger Jaramillo was positive he was talking about Irene Garza's murder. After speaking with Tashney, Ranger Jaramillo spoke with Father Joseph O'Brien, who finally admitted that John Fight had confessed to him all those years ago. The confession Father O'Brien detailed was very similar to Dale Tashney's. Father O'Brien said in the summer of 1960, following Irene Garza's murder and Fight's charges for attacking America Guerra, he traveled to see John Fight in McAllen. He said he pressured the young priest to admit what happened, and Father John did confess to him that he had murdered Irene. Father O'Brien claimed that he didn't want to go to the police because he didn't want to embarrass the Oblates or have John Fight sue him for slander. According to journalist Pamela Koloff with Texas Monthly, Father O'Brien broke down in tears once detectives turned the tape recorder off. The Texas Rangers urged the district attorney, Rene Guerra, to present evidence to a grand jury. In the face of all the evidence, now including the testimony of two witnesses that had heard John Fight's confession to the murder, the district attorney refused to take it to a grand jury. The Garza family was outraged. One of Irene's cousins, Linda, confronted Guerra at the courthouse, and he pointed his finger in her face and said, you will never get an indictment. You'll get one when pigs fly. District Attorney Rene Guerra did not believe that John Fight ever confessed anything to Del Tashney, and he thought Father O'Brien's story couldn't be trusted. According to Guerra, in his old age, O'Brien supposedly had dementia and could previously read or heard the details of Irene's murder, tainting his memories. Guerra had no proof of any medical condition Father O'Brien might have had. The DA's tasteless commentary on the Irene Garza case did not end there. In a July 2002 Brownsville Herald article, Guerra said, I reviewed the file some years back. There was nothing. Can it be solved? Well, I guess if you believe that pigs can fly, anything is possible. He coldly went on to say, why would anybody be haunted by her death? She died. Her killer got away. Unsurprisingly, this statement outraged the Garza family and friends. It only made them more determined in the press. There were numerous letters to the editor demanding Guerra's resignation. After years of heavy public pressure in 2004, D.A. Rene Guerra finally decided to bring the evidence before a grand jury in an attempt to indict John Fight. Unfortunately, the grand jury determined that there wasn't enough evidence to indict the former priest, which makes sense because they were only given audio tapes and transcriptions. Neither Tashney nor Father Joseph O'Brien were called to testify, and John Fight also was not called. He would probably have had to plead the fifth, giving the grand jury more reason to indict him. The case had reached another frustrating stall, this time lasting for nearly another decade. 
In April of 2014, CBS aired an hour-long 48 Hours episode about Irene Garza's murder. They alleged that Fight was Irene's killer and that his past had finally caught up to him. The episode generated an outpouring of support for the Garza family and a public outcry for the arrest of John Fight. There also happened to be a man named Ricardo Rodriguez who was campaigning against the now unpopular Rene Guerra for the district attorney's office in McAllen. Rodriguez used Irene's cold case as a platform in his campaign with the support of the Garza family. Rodriguez promised to reopen Irene's case. He had signs, banners, and t-shirts with Irene's photo captioned, Justice for Irene. He also ran a campaign commercial using photos of Irene with a voiceover attacking Guerra for disrespecting the pain of victims. Irene's family and friends campaigned for Rodriguez, and in November 2014, Ricardo Rodriguez was elected district attorney, handily beating Rene Guerra. Following his win, the newly elected district attorney Rodriguez made good on his campaign promise and oversaw the arrest and indictment of John Fight. On February 9, 2016, 83-year-old John Fight was arrested in his Scottsdale retirement community for the murder of Irene Garza. Following his arrest, Fight said, I've been questioned extensively about this dating back to 1960, so I'm disappointed but not surprised. The DA's prosecutor, Mike Garza, no relation to Irene, told CBS, there may be people who don't understand why an old man is being prosecuted, but make no mistake, this is an evil man. He was a predator. On November 28, 2017, 57 years after Irene's murder, the jury for Fight's trial was selected. None of Fight's family attended the trial and his wife refused to comment when contacted by the media. Due to the amount of time between Irene's murder and the trial, much of the prosecution's evidence was in the form of hearsay. They didn't really have any physical evidence left, but they did have the testimony of many witnesses. In order to show Fate's predatory and unsettling behavior towards women, the prosecution had multiple witnesses testify. A woman named Tilly Sanchez testified that in March of 1960, she was 21 years old and worked as a cook and cleaner for the Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Edinburgh, Texas. She testified that in March 1960, she went to the church's basement for supplies and multiple priests, including Fight, were down there. When she went into the basement, Fight said, how about closing the door and making Tilly disappear? Another encounter with Fight happened after America Garrow was attacked. Fight called Tilly and said, Tilly, you're next, honey. The court also heard the testimony of Beatrice Garcia, who had an uncomfortable and disturbing interaction with Fight on April 10, 1960, just days before Irene's murder. On that day, Beatrice Garcia was walking to work downtown in McAllen, close to Sacred Heart Church. Beatrice, who was 20 at the time, said she crossed the street, and John Fate approached her in his car. When she asked the man if he needed something, Fight said, I would love to take a picture of you dressed in black by the cemetery. All of the women who had unpleasant encounters with Fight, including America Guerra, Beatrice Garcia, and Tilly Sanchez, shared similarities. They were all beautiful and young Hispanic or Latino women in proximity to one of the two Sacred Heart churches. And Irene Garza fit that same description. John Fight was a predator with a very specific victim type. The prosecution argued that the three women had been the lucky ones, stating, these ladies are the proof that John Fight was released from his cage and was ready to attack. McAllen Police Chief Victor Rodriguez testified as a surrogate for the McAllen Police investigators who worked on Irene's case back in 1960. The chief said the original investigation was a thorough one. He believed Irene went to the rectory around 7 p.m. and shortly after, Fight attacked her, bound her, gagged her, and eventually killed her. The prosecution relied on the stories of Del Tashney and Father Joseph O'Brien to fill in the details of how Irene was killed and dumped. Both men broke into tears on the witness stand while telling their stories. Father O'Brien had previously told other people that John Fight confessed to him before coming clean to law enforcement. Former Dallas Morning News reporter Brooks Edgerton testified about a 2004 conversation he had with Father O'Brien in which the father said he had confronted Fight multiple times and after nearly coming to blows, John Fight confessed to killing Irene. According to the prosecution, police were suspicious of John Fight in the first place because he was the last person to see Irene alive, 
admitted the slide viewer was his, had scratches on his hands, and gave several inconsistent stories. The prosecution argued a sentiment that had been held by the Garza family for some time, but that they had no evidence of. That the Catholic Church had covered up the disappearance and murder of Irene by making a deal with then-DA Robert Lattimore back in the 1960s. Unlike the Garzas, though, this time around, the prosecution had their evidence of a cover-up, a letter written by a Father J.F. Pollicky from St. Helens Missions in Georgetown, Texas, in August of 1960. The letter had been found when prosecutors subpoenaed records from John Fight's former religious order, the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate, prior to the start of his trial. In the letter, Father wrote to a Father Lawrence Seidel, who was head of the southern region of OMI. Father Pollicky's letter said he spoke with the Hidalgo County Sheriff E.E. E. Vickers about John Fight and the murder of Irene Garza. He wrote, The sheriff's observations are not only keen, but based upon much experience in such matters, but seem to be the course we should follow. I gave this same set of observations to Bishop Riker, and he too is impressed with the saneness and the practicality of the sheriff's conclusions. Father Pollicky wrote that Sheriff Vickers believed the case was quite weak for the prosecution. He wrote, he is also of the opinion that the prosecution must be made to see just how weak their case is, lest they go off half-cocked and set the wheels into motion that would bring this out in the public and give the opponents of the church a field day. Father Paul Lickey also wrote out a specific plan to get John Fight out of the media's attention. First, the church would follow the sheriff's advice and not hire a lawyer. Second, they would not put a police detective on the case, since that would mean he would be snooping around, re-questioning witnesses, and stirring things up again. Instead, they would listen to the sheriff and hire a private detective who would sit down with members of the church and go over all of the information. The PI would then write a summary and present it on paper in such a way as to highlight the loopholes that are so numerous in this case. Once the summary was finished, the church planned to arrange a meeting with the McAllen police chief, the prosecutor, and Sheriff Vickers. At the meeting, According to Father Pollicky, the whole situation would be explained and the prosecution would be able to see how strong the opposition is to their charges. They can also be brought to realize, in a nice way, that the church will not take this sitting down. The Father's letter continued by suggesting that the church relocate John Fight to a different part of the country in order to handle his behavior. Pollicky said he trusted the sheriff's advice because he was Catholic, and he contended that the case could affect the reputation of the church but it could also damage the campaign of Catholic presidential candidate John F. Kennedy. Father Pollicky ended the letter with, Your worries are ours, since we fight the same evil one who has concocted this thing in his ceaseless fight against the church and to stop the good being done by our wonderful congregation. Catholic priest Thomas Doyle served as an expert witness in the area of victims affected by clergy. He said the damning letter from Father Pollicky was a smoking gun. Doyle testified that when it came to sexual abuse, the church would very often enter into an unofficial agreement with local authorities, but rather than prosecuting the priest, the priest would be sent to a monastery, on a retreat, or sent to another country to get him out of the picture. Doyle said, quote, In my experience, in the thousands of documents I've studied, this is the first time I've seen any organized plan of collusion and cover-up played out step-by-step in coordination with the civilian law enforcement. In an interview with 48 Hours, Father Thomas Doyle said it's notable that there's no mention of Irene Garza, her family, in this letter or any documentation I saw. All they were concerned about was covering it up. According to then-reporter and now-attorney Daryl Davis, after the plea deal was made, he and several reporters were called into D.A. Lattimore's office. There, they had an off-the-record meeting, where Lattimore told them about the plea deal with Father John. Davis said Lattimore knew Fight was guilty of attacking America Guerra and killing Irene Garza, and that the church was making a deal. The DA supposedly approved of the deal because the church was going to send Fight to a monastery for disturbed priests, where he believed the murderer would stay for the rest of his life. After the explosive testimony about the letter, Prosecutor Garza made an explicit and gut-wrenching closing statement. He described the sadistic way that Fight had abused Irene in the rectory basement. He stated that Fight stashed Irene down there, toying with her body, keeping it alive, torturing it, taking it over to another place where he could hold it while he goes back and says mass. The prosecutor pointed out the way that Fight had concealed his nature in front of other churchgoers that holy Saturday night, 
calling him a wolf in priest's clothing. The defense argued that all of the prosecution's evidence was hearsay. They didn't have any evidence that positively linked John Fight to the crime, and there was no evidence of foul play in the pastoral house or the rectory. Trace evidence from the car Fight was said to have used was not linked to Irene or to Fight, and his shoes had not been taken for comparison against plaster casts of shoe prints collected from the canal bank. The defense also said Dale Tashney and Father O'Brien's stories were false, stating that Ranger Jaramillo fed facts to Dale Tashney and Father O'Brien so he could close the case. Key to their argument was the prosecution's timeline, which they said was off, and that there was another person that they believed committed the murder. The defense said the prosecution's timeline was wrong, that Irene couldn't have been attacked at 7 p.m. The defense said witnesses saw Irene in the church at different times. She was seen arriving at the rectory at 7 p.m., and she was seen in the church at 8.15 p.m. No one reported seeing or hearing anything suspicious, and there were a lot of people in the church that evening. The defense contended that another priest, Father Richard Junius, could be responsible. He was also hearing confessions on April 16th and knew Irene. According to what John Fight had told the police back in the original investigation, Irene had originally called the church in hopes of having Father Junius hearing her confession that night. The defense said that when he was interviewed by the Texas Rangers, Father Junius appeared nervous. In response to this suggestion, the prosecution said Junius was never considered a suspect and that he had died in 2007, so of course he was not there to defend himself. The defense appealed to the judge about the plea deal made with D.A. Lattimore in 1962, which they had tried to lean on from the beginning as a reason to not allow John Fight's trial to happen. But all of their objections were overruled. John Fight declined to testify on his own behalf, saying, quote, It was a wrestling match between my vanity and common sense, and common sense prevailed. Following the closing arguments in the trial, the jury deliberated for almost seven hours. Finally, on December 8, 2017, the jury reached a verdict. John Fight had been found guilty of murder with malice aforethought. The next day, at the age of 85, he was sentenced to life in prison. Irene Garza's parents had long passed away and never saw her murderer brought to justice, but her many younger cousins and friends were there to tearfully hug each other in victory. Two years after he was found guilty in December of 2019, Fight filed an appeal listing 11 grounds of error. One of the grounds stated that when Fight took a plea deal for attacking America Guerra, he was promised he would not be charged for Irene's murder. All the other grounds were about allowing certain evidence or witness testimony in the trial. But before the appellate court could respond to these appeals, on February 11, 2020, 87-year-old John Fight was found unresponsive in his prison cell. He was pronounced dead at the hospital and had died from cardiac arrest. From the time he was found guilty on December 8, 2017, to the moment he was found dead in his prison cell, the disgraced former priest had spent only two years, two months, and three days in prison. Through the collusion of the city of McAllen's law enforcement and Catholic Church, he had spent nearly 58 years as a free man and experiencing the life that 25-year-old Irene Garza dreamed of, settling down, getting married, and having children. By the time Irene was 25 years old, she had surpassed all of her parents' hopes. She was a college graduate, a volunteer, a staple of the McAllen community, and a devout Catholic. Now, decades after her death, Irene's life is still making an impact. After John Fight was arrested for her murder, the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley's Criminal Justice Department started using Irene's case as a teaching tool on justice, hoping to better educate the next generation of investigators and members of law enforcement. When the Catholic Church's abuse scandal was broken in 2002, it became very clear that pedophile priests had preyed upon the weakest in their parishes. Kids from poor families or broken homes. Kids that thought of the church as a safe place and idolized the kindly priest who showed them attention. Although John Fight was not a pedophile, he still preyed on Irene Garza's faith, her love for the church, and her unfailing trust for a man of the cloth. I think back to that letter Irene had written to her friend. She said she had recently been going to communion and mass every day. You can't imagine the courage and faith and happiness it has given me, she wrote. Irene Garza was overcoming her shyness, excelling in her career, and was ready to find love. And she had taken all of her hopes and dreams to church with her, the safe place she and her family had gone to for years. But there was a predator watching her. 
he knew she would not be scared of a priest. He betrayed her trust and her faith. He denied her the last rites she would have been given in death as a faithful Catholic. Irene died alone and afraid. We can only hope that her unwavering faith in God saw her through her final brutal moments and that she and her family are at peace now that her murderer was finally brought to justice. Southern Fried True Crime is produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched by Haley Gray and written by myself and Hannah Newcomb. The episode was edited and mixed by Resonant Recordings. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio and the original graphic artist by Coley Horner. As some of you already know, Facebook shut down our original discussion group, but we have already started a new one. Search for Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group. We still worship our patron saint, Dolly Parton, share fun memes and delicious recipes, and most importantly, we are supportive and good to each other. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we meant it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium, where you can listen ad-free. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.